Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm your host, and I'm very happy to be with you here today. Today, we're going to address a uh, topic that is both complex and controversial, namely overdose prevention sites. We have uh, four distinguished uh, guests with us today, and it's, it's my uh, privilege to introduce them. We have Dr. Ju Nyung Park. Dr. Park is an assistant professor of medicine and epidemiology at Brown University. And she is a faculty member at the Center on Biomedical Research Excellence on Opioids and Overdose. Dr. Park's research focuses on promoting the health and well being of people who use drugs through harm reduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Park, for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Ed. Yes. We have with us today Michelle McKenzie. Uh, Michelle is Director of Community Engagement with the Center on Biomedical Research Excellence on Opioids and Overdose at Rhode Island Hospital. Michelle is a research associate with the Brown Alpert Medical School and has been conducting harm reduction and overdose prevention research for more than 15 years. Michelle is also a person in long-term recovery. Thank you, Michelle, so much for being with us here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. We have uh, with us today Sarah George. Sarah George is currently serving as the Chittenden County State's Attorney in Burlington, Vermont. Sarah was appointed by Governor Scott in 2017 and uh, uh, elected again in November 2018. Uh, Sarah is a, a mighty advocate uh, for social justice. Uh, she describes her role as just doing my part to overhaul a racist and classist legal system and replace it with healthy and vibrant communities. Thank you, Sarah, for your service and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. We also have uh, Grace Keller. Grace Keller is the program coordinator at Howard Center Safe Recovery right here in Burlington. Safe Recovery is our harm reduction center. Grace has worked on the front lines in our community for going on 14 years now. She and her team meet people who use drugs where they are and they offer them a wide array of innovative and life-saving supportive services. Thank you, Grace, for being here with us today. And mostly thank you for your service. Thank you so much for having me, Ed. I'd like to, um, I'd like to begin uh, the show by uh, focusing on the, 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 the very, it's difficult to focus on because it's so tragic, but I'd like to begin the show on focusing on the reality that we're facing today, uh, specifically in Vermont, and then we'll branch out to Nationwide a little bit later. But Sarah, do, could you begin by, by just giving the audience uh, an idea of what it is you face every day regarding this, people who inject drugs, people who use drugs, and drug overdose uh, fatalities? <clears throat> Sure. Um, so I really only have a great indication or a great perspective on Chittenden County, but luckily, I guess luckily, Chittenden County has over a third of the state's population. So I imagine um, we might be a little different from the rest of the state, but um, we're, we do overly represent um, a lot of the communities. Um, every year since I've been a prosecutor, this has been something that um, is on my mind. Um, part of our jobs as, as deputy state's attorneys and state's attorneys is that we have to go to the scene of every untimely death. And um, as a brand new deputy state's attorney straight out of law school, um, going to the scenes of overdose deaths was something that really struck me and hit me very hard, um, especially the younger people who had you know, a sports injury like I had many times and um, started out with a valid prescription that turned to heroin and, and died. Um, when I became state's attorney, that's when I really started looking at the work we were doing or more importantly, not doing in our communities to help people who use drugs. As a prosecutor, um, like many things, we've become the uh, role that has become part of our role is to essentially try to treat people who use drugs. And what I have learned is that that doesn't work, um, that we're not very good at it, and that um, forcing people into those situations is actually more harmful for them and the community. So right now, we were doing really great. Um, our numbers were still 
tragic and horrific, but we really were, I think, tackling it in a really good and, and harm reduction way. Um, but with COVID, our numbers are, are pretty dismal. Um, in Chittenden County, we've lost 32 people this year to overdose. And um, most of those individuals, at least uh, 26, um, were alone, um, either in their residences or in bathrooms. Um, one was in a, on a park bench, um, but all 26 of the 32 were alone. Um, so that, you know, I think in a pandemic where people are isolating themselves or are losing their jobs or are losing um, access to healthcare, all of those all of those barriers are making um, our communities incredibly unsafe and people who use drugs um, are in really dire circumstances. I do, you know, would obviously always give a shout out to Grace and the folks at Safe Recovery. Um, they are really doing incredible work for some of our most vulnerable people in the community who use drugs, but I do think there is an other uh, population of, of people that are not um, taking those opportunities and are isolating themselves in a way that um, is really scary and is, is, is leading to death. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And um, painful as it may be, um, this is, uh, we need to, to, to focus directly on this. Um, in Vermont in uh, 2020, if you see me glancing over to my left, it's because my notes are there. Uh, 2020, um, deaths rose in Vermont by almost 58%. We, were, we had the highest increase in the rate of death from uh, overdose fatality in America, in Vermont. Um, Grace, do you want to shed some light on that? Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about what your experience has been here in Chittenden County? Sure. Um, and I also like to give a shout out to Sarah because, you know, we have a strong partnership between harm reduction and our prosecutor's office, which is quite unique. Um, Sarah actually started this conversation a couple of years ago and got a commission of us together, um, people from the hospital, um, law enforcement, all walks of life. And we all uh, agreed that this was a, a path forward that we really should be exploring. So I, I always want to highlight that because in Vermont, we may take it for granted. It's not all that common that we have prosecutors that are such champions for this. Um, so I want to say that first and foremost. Um, what I can say is that uh, overdoses affect, so Safe Recovery has 5,000 members. Um, we are Vermont's oldest and largest syringe service program. We're the only full-time program in the state. So um, sometimes as high as 33% of our clients come from outside of Chittenden County. Um, but the, you know, the um, two-thirds come from inside of Chittenden County. And I've been in my job for 14 years. We are We've been open for 20 years. Um, and so when we're talking about these overdose deaths here, these are very often people we know, people we've worried about for years, people we have access to, people who have access to our services that we could be offering services to in, 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 in better ways to keep them safer. Uh, and when we did Sarah's uh, commission, we actually asked them and 91% um, and of our clients said they wanted a safer um, consumption site that they would use it and that they um, wanted a safer option. So when, I, when we talk about fentanyl and that's what's really driving the overdose crisis in, in Vermont right now, um, for about 18 years, we surveyed our clients and uh, about on intake about whether they've witnessed an overdose. And for those 18 years or 17 about, um, they would 23 to 26% would identify having witnessed an overdose. And in one year in 2017, that number jumped up to 81%. We're now at 86% of our clients reporting having witnessed an overdose. Um, and 57% of, of clients at that time were reporting that they'd overdose themselves. So we are really in a, in a crisis. Our clients are afraid. They're looking for support. Um, and every time when we lose a client, one of the hardest things for my staff is we sit down, we talk about things we could have done differently, but um, we oftentimes look at things that we don't have access to. And I think in this country, we've really started uh, with the pandemic. One of the things that's been heartening is hearing stories of people making sure the front lines have what they need. And you know that really came into our, our homes this year, people seeing that frontline workers and hospitals didn't have what they need. And when we look at opiate overdose um, and we look at this, this um, epidemic that we're going through, this crisis that we're going through, um, 
our frontline workers don't always have what we need. Um, and it's the one area where when, when frontline workers are saying what they need, stigma comes into play and we really um, talk, you know, uh, uh, continue to not be able to access things that we know would work. So um, for my staff and for me um, and on behalf of my staff, uh, we are really struggling. We are dealing with a lot of trauma, a lot of loss of clients. Um, and, and oftentimes we know them very well. We know their dreams, their aspirations. Oftentimes we know their family members and children, parents and partners. So we really want to keep looking at ways to improve things. Um, and out of those 5,000 members, we did not have a client death to COVID. We had one COVID hospitalization um, but that we know of. Um, but we our numbers for overdose are really um, really climbing and and sometimes in a weekly in a weekly uh, reoccurrence. So thank you for bringing this us all together to talk about this. I'm really excited to have people from um, outside of Vermont to talk about this too today. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Grace, for your contribution and your and your life's work. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in Vermont, I, I don't want us to be misperceived as somehow you know saying, oh, you're not doing enough or. Vermont, you're not trying hard, or there's, there's no criticism coming from the panel. There's no criticism coming from the show. You know, we know that Vermont is a, a leader in America. We have a wide um, low barrier access to buprenorphine. We have a treatment system, a hub and spoke treatment system that is second to none. We have no waiting list. We have, uh, thanks to Sarah George, uh, uh, Grace Keller and a number of other people. We have uh, successfully decriminalized uh, possession of small amounts of uh, buprenorphine. We have a number of harm reduction sites. We have uh, recovery centers. We have uh, recovery sen uh, sensitive communities. But but with all this, the 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 numbers keep mounting. The deaths keep mounting. And I, I'd like to cite a a, a quote from one of Dr. Park's recent um, papers, as she says, unfortunately, interventions fail to fully address the current wave of the opioid epidemic and often omit the voices of people with lived experiences regarding drug use. <clears throat> Every overdose death is a culmination of a long series of policy failures and the lost and lost opportunities for harm reduction. So I'd like to move into, into this now with all we're doing, Dr. Parks, uh, Dr. Park, what, what, do you, what do you see as the next um, scientifically based step in, in helping this population? Uh, thanks, Ed, for having me here and um, uh, starting this important conversation. Uh, so scientifically, I think um, we're kind of at a crossroads. Um, we have invested as a country tremendous amount of resources into um, both pre uh, public health, prevention, treatment, and law enforcement. And um, although we have seen some progress, um, obviously there are, as Sarah mentioned, um, many people who are still using drugs alone. and um, People, of, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to over the years in um, Baltimore and other places around the country, um, you know, talk about uh, feeling isolated, you know, dealing with mental health issues, dealing with trauma. And I think that we have a real opportunity right now to um, extend a lot of the great work that has already been done, whether it's peer outreach, recovery programs, emergency department programs, um, harm reduction centers, syringe exchange, um, naloxone programs, like the list is very extensive, especially in Vermont, which really is a um, leader in the country, um, to incorporate the reality that a lot of people are using drugs alone and in um, different unsafe, unhygienic spaces. So for example, um, for people who are stably housed and you know, they have a good support system, um, if they are you know, battling addiction or choosing to use drugs you know, in the safety of their home um, and there's somebody around to revive them with naloxone, then you know, an overdose prevention site would probably not be of as much interest. But the people that um, I've talked to, and I know Michelle has too, 
um, who are unstably housed, who are moving between places, um, who are living under bridges. Um, there are many people out there who you know, are dependent on drugs such as opioids and fentanyl and heroin and um, don't really have anywhere to go. And um, juxtaposed with that reality, they are also um, in an environment where um, what they are engaging in is inherently illegal. And so um, balancing the need to tr stay hidden from law enforcement, from getting into trouble versus um, dealing with a, you know, addiction or dependence um, and um, engaging in drug use, it's a, it's a tricky situation. And so overdose prevention sites are evidence-based spaces where mm. people, the hygienic, um, there are trained people on site who can supervise and intervene if something happens, something were to happen. Most of the time, nothing actually happens, um, nothing negative, I should say. Um, but in case there is an overdose, um, someone is there to respond with Narcan or oxygen or even call EMS. And the reason why these uh, interventions have been um, implemented across the world, over 100 locations, and um, supported by science and evidence is that at the heart of heart of these spaces is that they connect people. They connect people to um, services. They connect people to other harm reduction programs and just help to build relationships and re-engage people in the health system. And so I think that they have a lot of value. There are different models. Um, there isn't a one size fits all. There are multiple models that we can talk about, uh, but I think they are a really promising intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, would you like to care to elaborate a little bit on the same, uh, the same topic? Um, I, I would. I, I thank you, um, Ju, for that backdrop with um, what, uh, how um, harm reduction centers or overdose prevention sites, there's actually a number of names for them, really are evidence-based practice. And certainly our neighbors to the north have, um, have really invested in, uh, in harm reduction centers um, considerably. And honestly, really, so there's like 30, in 37 cities and towns throughout Canada, and um, many proliferated only in the last few years. In the last, they started, of course, several years ago with uh, Vancouver and uh, Insight in Vancouver, but really prolifer pro proliferated in response to fentanyl and recognizing that this was a very good, um, a, a, a very important step to save lives. Um, and here in Rhode Island, you know, um, Ed, you talked about how there we saw some gains. We saw um, a reduction in overdose deaths. Certainly, that was the case in Rhode Island between uh, between 2016 and 2019. But then, um, and but the before actually before COVID hit in December of 2019, Rhode Island started seeing increase increases in overdose. So we. We were really left with the reality that while COVID made things worse for all of the reasons that you, that Sarah and Grace talked about with regard to what, you know, the isolation and loss of employment, and it, I mean, the on and on, this cascade of things that would cause people to use. Um, for us in Rhode Island, it started before that. And in part, I think, that we are, you know, we have done really important steps as you talk about making naloxone available, um, increasing access to medications for opioid use disorder, both methadone and, and buprenorphine and, and now trexone to a lesser degree. Um, but what we are now really focusing on is, is addressing the problem and more and, and embracing even more, uh, even more a harm reduction approach. And so, that was um, evidence of this sort of really embrace of harm reduction was the legislative um, measures that passed this year. So we actually had three really big uh, laws that passed that I think go are very important in recognizing the um, failure 
of our drug policy that has focused on the criminalization of drug use mm. and, and seeing that substance use, drug use is a human behavior and that um, a more public health response is going to be, uh, be better. So the three pieces of legislation were um, the Harm Reduction Center passing a pilot harm reduction center, which we'll be talking about more obviously um, in the show. The other, another piece of legislation was um, uh, decriminalizing buprenorphine, which of course you guys, if you beat us to the punch, you did it in Vermont, which is wonderful. Um, and also um, reclassifying possession of any substance 10 grams or under as a misdemeanor possession rather than a felony possession. Um, and with the idea, you know, and that is, you know, there was a lot of conversation when we were passing that legislation because possession prior to this was, uh, or felony possession was 28 grams or under. Pe many people advocated for a larger, you know, more higher number of grams uh, because we recognized that uh, that you you really want if you're moving away from a criminal justice approach, you want to make cast the net as wide as possible. But we started with 10 grams, which is a wonderful step in the right direction, and um, and we will be looking at that and seeing well, what are the repercussions of the fact that people are not going to have to wor worry about criminal penalties for possession, and in fact. When you look at the barriers to engaging in treatment and barriers to um, getting the help that you need, there's no question that the criminalization that it, this is a, a criminalized activity comes into play. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michelle. I can't even uh, express how um, encouraging it is to to understand that. Uh, the legislatures and, and people with power are finally beginning to understand the dynamics of addiction and what, what, what people with addiction are all about and, and are beginning to move away from punishment. I think it was the Obama administration in 2013 that abandoned officially the war on drugs and began to take on a public education posture about the disease. But it seems like the culture itself is just way lagging behind in understanding what is going on with addiction. So, so hearing hearing uh, you know your your comments is is very encouraging. I'd like to make a comment. This is another one of Dr. Park's quotes. So we know that uh, overdose prevention sites save lives, but in addition, uh, she states that there are more than 110 overdose prevention sites in 66 cities worldwide. Evidence on the impact of overdose prevention sites demonstrates their significant association with reducing overdose fatalities, HIV and HCV transmission, so HIV and hepatitis C transmission, syringe sharing, public injection, it reduces all these, ambulance usage and crime. This is profound. Furthermore, overdose prevention sites increase entry into drug treatment have never housed a fatal overdose, have never housed a fatal overdose, and have been found to be cost-effective. So I'll just throw that out to the, to the panel for, for comments. We, have, we know what's happening outside overdose prevention sites. The death rate is skyrocketing, and this is what's happening inside overdose prevention sites. So I'll throw that out to the, to the panel. Who would like to comment on that? Grace, I pick you. <clears throat> well, I knew that was coming, um, which is good because I was thinking about it. Well, what I can say is I have been to Vancouver and I've been to Insight. I know Sarah has too. Maybe others on the call have. Um, and what was um, stark to me and uh, pretty emotional is talking to them about what happens when an overdose happens on site and having um, immediate access to people that can help who are right there, who are witnessing it within seconds. Um, and what happens at Safe Recovery? We've had 20 overdoses um, or 21, all but one was some, were people that overdosed other places and 
were brought to our office in a car, blue, not breathing and unconscious, um, and overdosed. And when that person, when, when those people were brought to us, the people with them are terrified. They have no idea how long it's been. If you've ever been in a situation like that, and I have, you know, there's no accurate way for you to say whether it's been a minute or 10. Um, and every time we've been able to reverse the overdose, um, but only because that metrics of getting the person to us just happened in enough time. Mm -hmm. So what we need is time. And, um, and any of those times, a lot of the, these people were not breathing, or at least from what we could tell. So that's time that oxygen is being, um, the brain's being robbed of oxygen. So seconds count here. And I, every time we've reversed somebody, I think, you know, all of us go through what would have happened if it had just been more seconds. And I think at this point, that's really what I, what we're talking about in the practicality of overdose prevention sites is that um, their staff is prepared, their staff is ready. They are there are people around that are watching. There are people around that that know. The people that are with the person also have the comfort of knowing that they're safe, that there's somebody there that can help them. Um, where the the amount of trauma also that goes through, even when somebody has an overdose that's reversed, um, the person, the people that are with them are terrified. Our staff is terrified. You know, the person who overdosed is terrified, and we've been just plain lucky that we've been able to reverse these overdoses. And so I think we, what we need to do is really focus on a science-based approach that really gets that time down um, and that really doesn't rely on luck. It relies on practical approaches that we know have worked in other areas. Yeah, well said, well said, and thank you, Grace. Sarah? Yeah, I'll just speak specifically to what you were saying about all of the reasons, um, all of the evidence-based reasons around the support for um, a safe consumption space versus what we have continued to do, regardless of what Obama has said, we are still fighting a, a quote unquote war on drugs. And um, and I think a lot of the problems with our criminal legal system in general is that we have a ton of evidence that says it doesn't work and we continue to do it because that's how we make money. Um, you know, we make a lot of money on policing, prosecuting and incarcerating folks for public health issues. And there are is a great desire to ignore the evidence um, in place of listening to data. And it, it happens with drugs, it happens with incarceration in general. Incarceration makes communities and people less safe and we continue to do it. Um, so I think that having a lot more, if, if, if we really wanna talk about the Obama administration or the Biden administration ending the war on drugs, then they should be decriminalizing drugs. Um, and that we're so far from that at this point, um, even within Chittenden County, we don't, we really don't prosecute them, but we get so much pushback from law enforcement and their, their quote unquote reasoning is how else will this person get treatment? And, you know, I think that that's such a, that's so telling that one, that law enforcement think that's the best way to get somebody treatment is to put handcuffs on them and send them into a courthouse. Um, and some of the reality of that is that it's true. And that's the really unfortunate part is that most people are getting connected to services through policing and prosecution instead of having more direct access to those services in our communities. We're a little bit more lucky in that sense in Chittenden County, but when you talk about more rural communities and communities that even if they had a safe consumption site, people don't have cars. They don't have an ability to get to those sites or get to counseling. Um, you know, I, I do think that there is a, a part of that is that we don't resource, we over-resource the police and prosecutors and we under-resource the, the folks that we actually want to do this work for the people that need it. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarah. You know, I think maybe at this point, we should begin to talk a little bit about stigma. We're doing we're doing well uh, with time. Uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, did a study a number of years ago, um, a global study, and they found that um, addiction was uh, the number one condition uh, that, that received the, the most and the most intense types of stigma. Number four was alcoholism. So it is. It makes you think that there's there's some sort of hierarchy of a stigma, or a totem pole, of stigma, and and people who inject drugs 
on the very bottom of it. And I do believe that, you know, this is one of the things, and I know we all agree that this is one of the things that's preventing us from moving forward. So Dr. Uh, Park and Michelle, do you have any, um, you know, through your research, have you, what have you learned about, about stigma toward people who inject drugs? And, and what do you think we can, we can do about that? Um, one of the things that has come up repeatedly um, and work that I'm, I'm currently working with the Rhode Island Department of Health and talking to folks who use in order to learn about what, what people's experiences are with our current policies, right? So what are people's experiences with accessing treatment, harm reduction services, et cetera? And one of the things that comes up repeatedly um, are people talking about their experience in, in um, healthcare settings, very, all, many healthcare settings, sadly, but very particularly in emergency rooms um, and sort of the emergency response system. And I think that the part of the um, really unfortunate treatment that people receive is very much rooted in stigma. It's also rooted in a system that's inadequate to the task of treating people's needs. So people end up, you know, getting um, a 911 call, police arrive, uh, EMTs arrive, and, and then the, and folks get um, transported to the, an emergency room. And particularly whenever you're looking at, you know, during health crises in general, so you've got COVID going on, you've got really a terrible impact um, because of the pan, uh, because of COVID, um, on our healthcare systems. And then you sort of add this layer of stigma. So people are being sort of forced into the system that people, that emergency, emergency room folks do not know how to treat really their needs well. And so it really builds up a lot of medical mistrust among people who, uh, people who use drugs um, and it builds up you know, a lot of resentment and contributes to, to stigma. And I think that, that the um, harm reduction centers actually will have a really important role to play in this. Because when you were talking about responding to overdoses, when overdoses are responded to in an overdose per, in a harm reduction center, people don't go to the emergency room. They are able to have the overdoses adequately responded to right there because you can see exactly what went on. You know when the person went out, you know that applying oxygen and naloxone, that can all happen safely at a harm reduction center, which means that all of the folks who would be utilizing the 911 system, and if, well, uh, that kind of ideally would, would have, and without a harm reduction center, that the 911 would get called. Um, they don't end up in the system. So they don't experience all of the sequelae of being caught up in this system. And it also, so that means that not only do they not have to go through it, it means there's actually less of a burden on the system overall. I actually think we need to make a lot of changes with it. Um, we've actually found here in Rhode Island, there's been a, de a decrease in calling 911 because of all the things that I just talked about. Um, so, but I, I think that the, that just the fact that you're going to have less of a burden of having people calling 911 once we get harm reduction centers open will make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Park, do you want to contribute to this part? Yes. Um, so I think, Michelle, you're like talking a lot about healthcare stigma and, and it reminds me of um, the you know, discussion around how institutions and laws can really shape stigma. There is a kind of bi-directional relationship. And so earlier we talked about, you know, drug use being illegal. And even when I was growing up, you know, that was the message I got at school and in college. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't necessarily have lived experience with substance use, then you might grow up and think, all your life that anyone who uses drugs is bad or um, people, you know, you might believe that people who are using drugs should be arrested. And so 
one, I have two examples actually of this. Um, one is that, um, and this is, you know, in addition to the barriers to education, housing, employment, um, our, when we talk about institutions, I think about the universities that I've worked at. Um, even places like universities that hire people like me who do harm reduction research can continue to perpetuate stigma. And that can be in the form of people not feeling comfortable disclosing about their recovery process, um, people not wanting to disclose their use of drugs. Um, and even when we are hiring other students and research assistants and community outreach workers, um, our institutions can stigmatize them by uh, mandating, for example, random drug checking, drug testing. Mm -hmm. And um, these programs, um, for some jobs, it kind of it makes sense. Um, but for other jobs, it's just a remnant of um, these prohibition, drug pro prohibition laws. And it's everywhere, everywhere you look, every institution you look at, um, you can see remnants of it. And, yeah. um, and I wanted to also mention, uh, just follow up on what Michelle said earlier. You reminded me, Michelle, of a time where I, I haven't even had a chance to tell you this, but um, I was a doctoral student conducting um, survey-based research in Baltimore. And um, there we were heading home, actually, you know, driving our van back to the hospital. And on the way, we saw an overdose on the street. And when we got out of the car, somebody, uh, like a bystander who didn't know this person, luckily was there and had called 911. So we were like, okay, great. So we run to the van, we get out in a lock zone, we're going to respond, but then the ambulance arrives. And so we're like, great. The ambulance, in addition to naloxone, has oxygen, has like healthcare professionals. This person's going to be okay. I have never seen such a slow response to a emergency situation. The, you know, EMS workers, they walked there. They joked about the person who was clearly in distress. And I almost like pushed them out of the way to administer the Narcan because um, this person was, you know, seconds away, as Grace said earlier, seconds away from, you know, having cognitive damage or death. And it was an extremely scary situation. It was the first overdose that I saw um, as a young student. And that really stuck with me. And so when we talk about stigma, um, it's in our healthcare system. It's um, in, our, in the institutions that we work at. Um, and it's a, something that we definitely need to tackle alongside um, providing these harm reduction programs. Well said. And I, I, think, I um, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Grace. sorry. One no, of the things ahead. that I see a lot is, um, is where this danger, most dangerous too, is um, internalized stigma. Uh, you know, I've been here long enough to have experienced a two-year waiting list for most of our clients to get access to medication-assisted treatment. And I was also the program that got to start a program that got to start having immediate access to buprenorphine at our office. And um, the one of the first few days, um, what happens with the in our population that you still see remnants of is um, is a scarcity mentality. When we had no resources for people in this situation, they had to survive by taking care of themselves and each other. Um, and so, one of the first days of low barrier buprenorphine, we were ready to get, you know, we had people ready to go get people into treatment. One of the first women was somebody I knew for a long time. She'd been trying to get into treatment. And I talked to her, I'm like, you, we can get you in today. Right now, we can get you in front of our provider. And she had come in to see me because she had um, overdosed and been sexually assaulted that weekend. And when I said to her, we can get you into treatment right now, the first thing she said is, I bet there's somebody who needs it more than I do. And I don't want to take up a spot. And that's the system that we've sort of created when we didn't have treatment for somebody is there's always this perfect individual who's going to take that spot and do everything that what you know um, somebody th thinks is going to happen. If you're in a waiting list, there's always somebody behind you that might deserve it more or might be more successful. And I think that that's what we're still up against. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things that plagues my staff and I is when, when we've had overdose deaths, 
there are conversations about stigma that ring in our heads. People talking about how they were afraid of medication assisted treatment or ashamed of certain things, or especially when you talk about relapse, that's the, one of the most dangerous times, but it's one of the most highly stigmatized and shame times. Um, so that's where I think also um, overdose prevention sites or whatever term we're using can really help people to work through that. That's where syringe exchange si uh, shines is helping people through relapse. It's, relapse is not an area that you can talk to a lot of people about, not even in our systems, not with our providers, not in some of the support groups that people are in. So I think that's another area that we need to talk about is like this internalized stigma that, that exists that we're always going to be up against, but that systems create and reinforce all the time in the in the minds of patients that just need compassion. Exponentially in 2020. Uh, we have, according to uh, research done at uh, Grace's uh, site, uh, a willingness on uh, like 90% of the people who use her site would use uh, uh, an, an overdose prevention site. Um, we have, I think we have, coming into the state, uh, significant amounts of resources, uh, settlements with um, wholesale opioid distributors, and in the near future settlements with the Sackler family. So millions of dollars per year coming into the state. So we have the need, we have the willingness, we have the research, and we will have the funds. What, what, you know, what, what can I say about this? you know, the, the table is set. And Dr. Park, I think I, I'm going to pick on you because during your last presentation at ComStat, in response to a question that I posed to you, your last four words were, the time is now. So what do we do now? What's the next step for us in Vermont who have, our constituent has no voice. People who inject drugs have no voice. We are their voice. How do we use our voice to move forward for them? How do we do this? Well, what kind of suggestions does the panel have? <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm really fortunate to have um, recently moved to Rhode Island where um, the, it, it is the first state in the whole country that has legalized a pilot program um, mm -hmm. to implement and evaluate a harm reduction center or multiple harm reduction centers, in fact, and so um, I think that legislation is one area that you know um, Vermont could organize around. Um, there are also many community advocates um, who are working to get community support in Rhode Island. So that's an ongoing process and Michelle um, can speak to that aspect. Um, but it is, the time is definitely now. Um, I think that we have the evidence, we just uh, need to get the right investments um, and get the right people on board to move this forward in Vermont. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be, I think we'll be looking to you for you and, and Michelle and others in Rhode Island for guidance. Thank you. Michelle, do you wanna comment on that and expand on that? Um, I, I will, just on the idea of a coalition, I think that one of, there were a couple of reasons that the legislation passed this year. I'm not gonna lie, a couple, one of the reasons is that we had a change of leadership in the state house mm -hmm. and that made a big difference. And we actually had uh, in the last couple of years got uh, have a new attorney general um, and that those changes in leadership at the state level really helped us. Um, but the other thing is that we have had folks doing the advocacy and legis uh, legislative lobbying for several years, developing relationships and really calling and putting together a wide coalition. So it, the people who were at the state house um, testifying were of course um, uh, people who were involved in harm reduction work um, and researchers, but also medical providers, um, uh, substance use uh, disorder treatment providers, um, a, re, folks in recovery and recovery advocates, um, people from different, uh, really many different uh, disciplines and people, people who are do like, for instance, generally do more work sort of around 
criminal justice issues, they were there um, pulling those folks into the um, mix. And I think, oh, and actually, and this is critically important, um, people with lived experience so that the, because facts and figures obviously have to be part of it, and this is evidence-based practice, but what I think that talking from the heart um, makes a really uh, big impression on, you know, in these committee hearings, because they're in hours and hours of committee hearings, so really talking from the heart, so a, a large coalition um, and really letting people tell their stories. Thank you. Thank you. Well said and heard. Um, I know that Sarah put together a commission a number of years ago that had a wide array of um, allies. Sarah, do you want to talk about who was on that commission and who you see as in support of this kind of uh, movement or activity in Vermont? Mm. Sure. So this was very early on in my, um, after being appointed state's attorney, and I really didn't know a lot about it. Um, I didn't know a lot about harm reduction in general or um, safe consumption spaces. And so I, I had the commission made up of um, folks from Safe Recovery, um, including uh, somebody in recovery and um, law enforcement, I had two law enforcement officials on it. I, ha I had a program coordinator on it. Um, somebody from another syringe exchange program um, within the state that was mostly outside of this county, their work was, which was helpful for the more rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was it. And interestingly, coming into it, you know, especially for the law enforcement, and, and frankly, even myself, really not knowing a lot about it, my initial response was like most people that I was a little skeptical of it and whether or not that was actually the right way to be going. And um, everybody by the end was, nice. including law enforcement, was like, this is clearly an option that we need to be looking to support. The, the one hesitation from law enforcement specifically was they really wanted legislation around it, just I think, frankly, for liability purposes more than anything, but um, there was never a hesitation around towards the end about like whether it was when and how was really how the conversation quickly turned when you start looking at the evidence and research. It's hard not to. I mean, you say all those things that you were saying before, Ed, you know, when we started doing all of the research and laying that out for folks, it's like, it's really hard not to appreciate how much better off we could all be if they were in place. Beautiful. And uh, th thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Park and Michelle and um, uh, Grace. You know, I'd just like to add, over the past couple of weeks, I was in touch with uh, Tom Dalton, who is the executive uh, director of Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. His organization, or, or he specifically, is very much in, in favor of this kind of effort in Vermont. I'm a, I was a clinical social worker, so I was in touch with the um, NASW Vermont chapter. They don't have a decision yet, their board, but they supported this uh, kind of activity over those prevention sites in California. So it looks like they'll be supporting us in Vermont. I was in touch with um, the Vermont Recovery Network Board, which is uh, composed of directors of recovery centers in Vermont. We have 12 of them. So people out there, right, you know, in grassroots, right on the front line, their board is in favor of um, overdose prevention sites. And I've been in touch with the Vermont um, Addiction Professionals Association. So these are all the providers, these are the clinical providers. Their board voted unanimously to support this idea. So it's there's growing support in Vermont. I, I will pledge to um, dedicate a number of shows uh, uh, the end of this year and over next year, specifically focused on, on this topic and we'll be disseminating them as widely as possible uh, to see if we can maximize support. Um, the will of the people is, is important. And I do believe that if the people are educated, if, if, if their consciousness is expanded, if they can open their minds, their hearts open, and, and we will have their support and therefore we'll have the, the legislature. So I wanna, I wanna thank you um, all. And also 
Um, I think Michelle mentioned uh, people with lived experience. Uh, I've, I've got um, a, a couple of things going on now where I've got some people reaching out to people who are injecting drugs. And I'm going to invite them on the show with uh, safeguards to their confidentiality. And uh, we're going to try to get you know, their lived experience out into the public, what it's like and what would help them. So it's a very exciting time. I want to I want to thank my panel from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much uh, for being uh, with us here today. Any any closing comments uh, from any of you? Thank you for um, bringing us all together. Yeah, this was great. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. All right. All right. Thank you. And, and audience, just, you know, keep tuning in. All right. For, for some great information from some great people. Thank you. Thank you.